If I can call the, the meeting to, to order, um, as you all know, our speaker today is um, Karen Banks, uh, who is one in a, a long line of distinguished um, uh, uh, Irish uh, citizens who have um, uh, uh, done great work um, in the European Commission. Karen is presently Deputy Director General of the Legal Service of the European Commission, and prior to that uh, was Director responsible for running the AgriFish team of the Legal Service. Uh, but she has a, um, a, a long track, track record of running in a lot of um, uh, work in a lot of different areas, competition law, social law, intellectual property law, and external relations of EU law. I'm uh, glad to be able to say she's a graduate of the institution in which I teach, the law school in University College Dublin, uh, but she also has a master's degree um, uh, from uh, LSE uh, as well, and indeed worked as a solicitor in general practice before joining uh, the Commission. Um, in her address to us today, um, Karen is going to um, uh, do a number of things, uh, to look at how EU law can affect national rules concerning the judiciary and the administration of justice at national level, uh, discuss how EU law uh, relies on national justice um, uh, systems. Um, uh, um, uh, she is uh, going to also uh, outline how fundamental rights uh, embedded in cross-border legislation can have profound uh, implications for uh, national um, uh, justice uh, systems. Now, I understand, um, uh, as, as usual, um, the um, uh, initial address will be on the record, but the Q&A session afterwards uh, is under the Chatham House rules, which obviously means that you can use the information but not uh, attribute it. Could I just remind everyone as well to switch your phones to silent if you already if you, you haven't done so already? In fact, I'm I'm going to do that immediately myself as, as soon as I stop talking. And, uh, and, uh, and if you want to tweet, um, uh, use the handle um, at IIEA as well. And uh, we'll keep going. I think we have until two, so we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to. Uh, we'll, we'll go until then and we'll, we'll draw to a sharp close at that stage so everyone can get back to their, their, um, their places at that stage. So, Karen, the floor okay. is yours. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here. I am. Um, to speak to you uh, this afternoon about the implications of EU law for national justice systems. And the uh, point that one has to begin with is the principle that EU law relies on national court uh, structures and procedural rules to ensure its effective application. So you have to see, if you like, the substance of EU law being filtered down towards the citizen or the companies or whoever is going to be affected by the EU rule uh, through the national procedural rules. And there are many judgments of the Court of Justice in which it has uh, insisted on, on that idea. Of course, that is subject to one or two qualifications related to the uh, effectiveness of EU law. So if you have a national procedural rule that would uh, make it too difficult to get access to your EU law right, uh, that may have to be uh, modulated a bit. And there is, of course, the requirement of equivalence. So you can't have national procedural <coughs> rules that are harder to get over, so to speak, uh, in relation to EU law rights than they would be in relation to the equivalent national rights. Similarly, it must be possible for interim relief uh, to be uh, granted where that would be necessary in order for your long-term legal action uh, to uh, arrive to its, its purpose. There have been quite a few questions about time limits laid down uh, in national law for the bringing of actions. And again, in general, these are fine, as long as they are no less favorable than they would be in a purely national situation and don't render practically impossible or excessively difficult uh, the access to the right based on EU law. The nature of EU law uh, may cause occasional interferences with national rules. Um, you have to think, for instance, about Article 267, so the possibility for national courts to refer uh, questions of the interpretation or validity of EU law to the Court of Justice, and the uh, fact that the Court is very keen on the idea that lower courts should feel themselves just as free as uh, superior courts to make such references. So whenever it comes across an obstacle in national law that would prevent or make it very difficult for uh, a lower court to make a reference, uh, the Court is fairly uh, severe on those. Then, um, Coming closer to an Irish case, there is, of course, the case law on the obligation for national courts to disapply any national rule which would be contrary to a directly applicable EU rule. Um, and therefore, that implies that any court which is competent to hear a case based on EU law has to have the faculty to disapply an incompatible national rule. 
And some of you may have heard of uh, case C378 of 17, the Minister of Justice and Equality and the Commissioner for the Garda Siohana uh, against the Workplace Relations Commission. This was a reference from the Supreme Court. Um, in the background was an alleged age discrimination. Two candidates to join the Gardaí uh, said that they had been discriminated against because of their age. Uh, and the case was brought before the Workplace Relations Commission. The point was that in order for them to win, they were going to have to get a national rule disapplied. They were going to rely on their EU right not to be discriminated against. And uh, the question was whether the Workplace Relations Commission was competent to disapply national law. Under purely national law, it wouldn't have been. It didn't uh, qualify as a court in the meaning of the Constitution. Um, and the Supreme Court, um, which made, I found, a very persuasive reference, tried to persuade the Court of Justice that, uh, after all, uh, the people in question could have brought their action before the High Court if they had anticipated the fact that the national rule might need to be disapplied. Um, but the court said, no, 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 any court before which such a case can come has to be able itself immediately and without having to stop the case and allow it to go to another court, uh, it has to be able to do whatever it needs to do in order to make the EU law right effective. And that implies uh, being able to disapply a, a rule of national law. So there you have a direct interference with a rule of national law and a requirement that it yield uh, to the primacy and effectiveness of EU law. The area of judicial and police cooperation touches, of course, on sensitive areas uh, of national competence. And you might expect uh, a good deal of interference with uh, national rules in this area. But as the word cooperation implies, um, in reality, in general, this area is really dealing with the interaction of separate systems and the mechanisms to make that cooperation possible, um, largely leaving intact the structures and rules on either side. Judicial cooperation is essentially based on the principle of mutual recognition. On the civil side, I think there is generally little interference uh, with national procedural law. There are exceptions, of course, for instance, where an instrument creates a completely new EU-wide procedure, like the European Enforcement Order for Uncontested Claims. That lays down uh, procedural minimum standards uh, in order to explain how the system is intended to work. For instance, uh, there are rules about the service on the debtor, the information that has to be provided to him, and so on. Other cases um, arise where the system being introduced will only work if certain minimum rules are introduced. There is, for instance, Regulation 2019-1111, on recognition and enforcement in matrimonial matters. Generally speaking, it's based on national procedural rules, but there is an article, Article 24, relating to child abduction cases, which lays down a six-week time limit. In principle, there are a few possibilities of extending it, but in principle, a six-week time limit, both for the first instance and the appeal courts to deal with the matter. That was apparently very controversial in the Council of Ministers because for some member states, the very idea of imposing a deadline by when a court has to have done its work was regarded as uh, outrageous. On the criminal side, um, there are a number of instruments on procedural safeguards for suspects and uh, accused persons, and on the rights uh, for victims of crime. Uh, those, of course, must be incorporated in national law, so there you have a direct uh, impact. Um, an example would be a right to information in relation to your right to a lawyer, or about right to legal aid, or the right to remain silent. There has been a clarification from the court that these kind of rules apply also in purely internal situations. So although the legal basis for the adoption of these rules talks about the need to enable cross-border prosecutions, for instance, to happen, that doesn't mean that the rules once adopted are not also applicable in purely internal uh, litigation. The idea being that uh, the way the cross-border situation will be facilitated will be by judges on both sides having familiarity and knowing that the rules on the other side are very similar to the rules uh, with which he or she is familiar. 
There are other instruments based on mutual recognition, for instance, the European Arrest Warrant. Uh, this is Council Framework Decision 2002-584. And here, a certain number of uh, basic rights are laid down, but this is essentially a cooperation mechanism uh, between judges on both sides. However, it has to be read in the light of fundamental rights considerations, which have proved, as this instrument has been worked, uh, to be very important and to impose quite some uh, burden on, on judges uh, who have to operate the system. One question which arose in an Irish case, a case called Lanigan, is how long can someone be held uh, in custody um, after the European arrest warrant has been applied for but before a decision has been taken? Um, Mr. Lanigan, who was wanted in the north on, I think, terrorism-related charges, um, had been in jail almost one and a half years before the first hearing happened in front of the High Court. And between various delays, partly caused by him, because, of course, he kept raising objections and saying if he was sent to jail in Northern Ireland, his life would be in danger and so on. Uh, so two and a half years passed before the referral to the Court of Justice. And as you can imagine, another couple of years passed uh, between one thing and another. So he was a long time in jail, and the maximum is meant to be three months. So uh, he, of course, uh, cheekily applied for release on the basis that his fundamental rights uh, were being breached. Article 6 of the Charter on Fundamental Rights, uh, which deals with liberty and security of person. And so this tricky question uh, came before the court. Uh, the Irish court asked, do I have to release him? Have his fundamental rights been breached to an extent that I can no longer hold him? But the court said, no, 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 <laughs> no automatic freeing, please. Um, the judge, poor judge, has to weigh on the one hand the justification for the delays, all the circumstances that can allow you to think that it was inevitable that these delays would occur against the fundamental right of an individual not to be unjustifiably deprived uh, of uh, his liberty. Uh, and again, poor judge, if he or she finally decides to release uh, the accused, he has to take the measures necessary to ensure that there will be no absconding. So good luck. Uh, the second uh, issue of fundamental rights which has arisen here uh, relates to conditions in the prisons of the requesting state. Um, there have been a number of cases uh, about this. So you have here the need to read the EAW in the light of Article 4 of the Charter, which uh, deals with inhuman and degrading treatment, a concept with which Irish people are, I think, familiar. We all have that in our minds from our law studies. Um, the court says that such a breach, so a breach of this right, the right not to be subjected to inhuman uh, or degrading treatment, cannot uh, result, may not be allowed to result from the execution of a European arrest warrant. However, so that means that a judge who is asked to execute such a warrant to send someone to a country where it is alleged that the prison conditions are pretty dreadful has a uh, a very severe uh, constraint on, on his or her mind as to whether they can execute this. However, um, the judge also has to take great care in reaching a conclusion uh, which would prevent the execution of the warrant. First of all, you need to have objective, reliable and specific information which is properly updated, uh, allowing you to conclude that there is a general problem relating to the prison conditions in the issuing member state. In that respect, the judge has to look at uh, judgments of international courts, judgments of the courts of the issuing member state, reports of bodies of the UN or of the Council of Europe, and so on. So this is the first mental exercise that has to be gone through. And even if he or she is then satisfied that there is a structural problem, the question then becomes, in the second step, whether uh, this is really likely to be the fate of the individual if they are sent back. Will they go to a jail in which the conditions are that bad? And in order to find this out, uh, the executing judge has to ask questions of the um, issuing uh, judicial authority. The court has 
put one little element of mercy for the judge uh, into its most recent judgment. It's not necessary to look at the conditions in all prisons to which this person might ever be sent. Because that was what uh, a German court had asked. Uh, they put forward multifarious questions in great detail, asking about the exact square meterage of the cell and did you have to take account of the furniture and all the rest of it. And amongst other things, and, and uh, it's, it's a reasonable question on an intellectual level, do I look just at the jail where they tell me he's going to be sent or do I also think about all the places where he might be sent in the course of his uh, jail career? Uh, so the court said, no, you don't have to do that. You just have to look at the um, prisons where it would be intended to send this person. But there is, uh, as I say, a great deal of uh, detail that has to be uh, looked into. And bearing in mind that uh, the court has said that there can be no balancing uh, of a breach of Article 4 with the requirements for the efficient working of the uh, European arrest warrant mechanism, um, or with considerations of judicial cooperation, uh, this again is a, a pretty heavy exercise that the unfortunate executing judge has to go through. A third issue uh, is that of a fair trial and the independence of the judge who is uh, likely to hear the case of the person if they're sent back uh, to the uh, requesting member state. Here, I think uh, we can say that the leading case is, again, uh, a case that came from Ireland, the case of LM, um, where uh, the High Court here was being asked to send someone back to Poland. And at the time, the Commission had produced um, a reasoned opinion based on Article 7.1 of the treaty, uh, which is the rule of law mechanism. Uh, in which we had elaborated all the unpleasant uh, things that were going on in relation to putting pressure on judges in Poland. And of course, it was not difficult for the High Court to see, at least at the general structural level, that there was clearly a risk to judicial independence. And the argument was ably made in front of the court that uh, if uh, Mr. Chelmer because the court has now decided to anonymize, but we know his name was Mr. Chalmer. Um, if he was sent back to Poland, uh, he would risk being uh, tried by a, a non-independent uh, court. So um, the Court of Justice was then asked, well, wh what do I do? Is it enough that I know on a structural level that there is a problem, or do I have to go further in examining the situation? And as with the problem of the uh, jail conditions, uh, the answer came back, yes, you have to go beyond that. You have to look into the personal situation of the individual, the likelihood that given his personal circumstances, the nature of the offence uh, with which he is uh, going to be um, uh, accused, um, that at an individual level, there is a serious risk that he would not have a fair trial, that he would not have an independent judge. Um, a point in that case was... It can be very tricky thinking about these questions of judicial independence. On the one level, there's no doubt that the judges in Poland are under tension, that they are at a level of feeling themselves to be somehow menaced. On the other hand, it doesn't follow that every judge acts in a non-independent way. And in particular, when the offence, as in this case, is a completely non-political offence, he was being accused of drug trafficking, um, there actually is, in common sense terms, no reason to think he won't get a fair trial. But how to reconcile that with the fact that we know that on a structural level uh, there is an issue uh, with judicial independence. So uh, the court tried to deal with it uh, in this way of saying, again, a two-stage analysis. First, the general structural issues, but then please don't stop there. Go on and really try to satisfy yourself uh, as to whether in the concrete circumstances of the case uh, this person can get a, a fair trial. Again, it's quite a burden for the executing judge. And then the um, final issue that I think has come up under the question of um, executing EAWs is the need for an independent judicial authority to have issued the warrant uh, in the first place. There is a case from Sweden called Polterak, where uh, the EAW had been issued by the police uh, because that was the way it worked in Sweden. And the court said, no, that won't do. It has to be a, 
an authority independent of the executive. It has to be a, a judicial authority. The court has shown some um, flexibility. It allows public prosecutors to issue uh, European arrest warrants as long as they are wholly independent. So again, uh, there were a couple of references from Irish courts concerning the German and the Lithuanian public prosecutors. And this caused a good deal of excitement in the place where I work, in the legal service, because the German lawyers um, were, they realized they were going to have to plead it, but it sort of went against the grain with them, because they know how great prestige attaches to public prosecutors in Germany, uh, how much part of the system of administration of justice they are, how exceedingly unlikely it is that they would get instructions from the minister, how they would resist such instructions if they got them, how they would insist on having them in writing. They know all these things, but at the same time, the theoretical possibility exists that in Germany, uh, a public prosecutor can receive an instruction from the minister. And the court said, right, so that won't do. Whereas the Lithuanian public prosecutor is, uh, it's even written in the Lithuanian constitution that he has to be wholly independent and can receive no instructions. So that one was allowed to pass muster. And then very recently, uh, just a few days ago, we had a judgment about the Austrian system, which um, involves the public prosecutor issuing the warrant, but it's then reviewed by a court. And uh, the Court of Justice has said, well, all right, as long as it's a proper review and not just a rubber stamping exercise, uh, then that will be all right. So the question of judicial independence, uh, as you can see, is very much um, at the heart of what we're thinking about uh, in the legal service of the Commission at the moment. And it's also at the core of the litigation we've been conducting against Poland. Um, we have had uh, two cases uh, so far, we have a judgment in, in one case and um, a judgment pending in a second. And a third case is just about to be launched. And what are these all about? Um, in the case of the ordinary courts, we brought two arguments. Uh, one was to do with sex discrimination because when the retirement age of judges was changed, um, and reduced for the ordinary courts, not content with applying the new age to judges who were sitting. Uh, the Polish authorities also decided to reintroduce the difference in age, which they had previously abolished. So we had an argument there about uh, sex discrimination. But if you like, the more fundamental, the more rule of law uh, problem, it was the fact that they had abruptly reduced the retirement age including for judges who were sitting, including for judges who were already at that new retirement age and who had to go immediately. And on top of that, in order to stay on, you had to apply to the Minister for Justice for permission. The Minister had no clear criteria to apply in order to know whether he would or he wouldn't give you your extension of time. There was no deadline for him to answer. And during that time, you continued sitting as a judge. So the chances that you would be able to free your mind of the fact that you were depending on the minister for something uh, while you were judging cases that might be sensitive uh, was um, not very great. So that case has actually, we're still waiting for judgment. Judgment is due uh, on the 5th of November. We've had the opinion of the uh, Advocate General, but not yet the judgment. In the meantime, we started a case about the Supreme Court, and that case passed the other one out because it was very urgent, and in fact there we already have a judgment. Um, in the case of the Supreme Court, the sex discrimination <coughs> issue didn't arise, but we had, uh, again, the abrupt reduction of retirement age, and this time it was going to mean that one-third of the members of the Supreme <coughs> Court, including the President, uh, we're going to have to retire with immediate effect. And so we decided to um, pull out the stops and go for interim measures and expedited proceedings. And the court granted us the interim measures. And uh, <coughs> to be fair to the polls, they implemented them. And they, uh, we had asked for the, um, for the measures to be suspended pending the outcome of the, of the uh, long-term court case. But in fact, um, the polls obviously decided that the game was up and they uh, completely changed the rules so that the reduction in retirement age would no longer apply to anyone who was already 
in a judicial position uh, before the coming into effect of, of the law. And they have abolished the mechanism because they're also for the Supreme Court. There was this mechanism for extension. This time you had to apply to the president and same thing, no criteria, no deadline, et cetera, et cetera. And that mechanism has been abolished. However, we uh, decided in any case, even though in practical terms you could have thought the problem was then solved, but since this was a very important case uh, of principle and we wanted clarification from the court that what we were saying was right, that is to say that uh, these kind of um, phenomena could be a breach of the treaty. And why is that? Well, the construction is that it's quite adventurous, but the court has agreed with it, that Article 19 of the uh, Treaty on European Union gives to the member states the job of ensuring that there are effective review mechanisms for the enforcement of EU law. And in combination with that, you have Article 47 of the Charter on Fundamental Rights, which talks about the right to an independent uh, court. And so we, putting these together, we said, right, that must mean that uh, judges who have the job of deciding on EU law matters must be independent. And that uh, approach has been, has been uh, confirmed by the court. So we um, now have judgment in the first case, and we are waiting for judgment in the case about the ordinary courts. And just about to launch is a case about the disciplinary regime, which is applied to judges in Poland. Uh, because they can be disciplined for the content of their judgments. And we think that's not too good. And there are a few other things like the disciplinary chamber and um, the manner in which they are treated. If a disciplinary case is proceeding against them, they're given no time to consult with their lawyers and various uh, aspects like that. So um, I think we can say that although EU law uh, does not in any way uh, want to replace all national uh, procedural rules or determine what court should be competent for what uh, kind of matter. It is still the case that the um, nature of EU law and certain specific rules like uh, the question of, of judicial independence uh, have nevertheless considerable implications for national justice systems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.